2 p.m., 11 a.m. East uh, Pacific time. As a reminder, today's webinar is scheduled for approximately one hour. The presentation portion will be 45 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. I'll be back in five minutes or so, so we can begin as scheduled. Thank you. Torrance Oil Refiner Explosion Response, Crisis Communication, and Agency Coordination. In this webinar, our presenters will discuss and examine why Torrance needed a system, communication strategies prior to a system, recent events, lessons learned. In addition to this, after the session, uh, we will provide our audience a 10-minute Q&A session with our speakers. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar. You may send your questions by typing the open text field in the questions panel and sending your questions to all panelists. If time runs out before your question is asked, we will try to follow up with you after the webinar. Links to the recording of the webinar and slides from today's presentation will be available on our blog within a few days. You can also look for a link to all recordings of our webinars on everbridge.com under the resources section. If you're on Twitter, we encourage you to take a moment to follow us at Everbridge um, and use hashtags, hashtag Everbridge and hashtag Customer Perspective to share snippets of insight throughout our program with your followers. We'll even retweet some of your comments. And now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our speakers. Our first speaker is Soraya, and she is the Emergency Services Manager for the City of Torrance and she was the emergency services coordinator prior to that. She has operational knowledge and expertise in local government, police and fire department operations and organization, healthcare administration, and medical and emergency medical services. Prior to her roles for the city of Torrance, she worked as a disaster resource center manager for UCLA Health. Joining uh, Soraya from the city of Torrance is their deputy fire chief, David Dumais. David Dumais has 31 years of fire service, 28 years with the city of Torrance, and he has been a, an, a chief officer for 11 years. He has held ranks of firefighter, fire inspector investigator, firefighter paramedic, engineer, captain, battalion chief, and deputy fire chief. As deputy chief, Chief Dumais oversees three operational platoons of the department as well as the training divisions, EMS coordination, and special services section. In addition, uh, Chief Dumais manages the department program organization. Chief Dume represents the fire chief as the state operational area G coordinator and its liaison for ExxonMobil refinery operations. Chief Dume sits on many, um, on many committees, both within the city of Torrance and within the region. After David and Sarai, we will hear from our very own Claudia Dent, Vice President of Product Management at Everbridge. Claudia has many years of experience in the technology industry and has held executive positions in both product management, marketing, business development, in general management at companies ranging from startups to large global enterprises. We're excited and honored to have all of our experts here with us today. And now I will turn it over to you, Soraya. Thank you, Michael. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, okay. loud and clear. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for having us today. We are really excited for the opportunity to discuss some of the lessons learned and things that we learned from recent inc incidents and events that we've had in our city. Um, so hopefully um, customers and those on the call can really take an opportunity to, to learn from some of the issues that we had and we're hoping that this can be a really good lessons learned um, process improvement for other cities and, and government entities. So thank you for having us. So just to give you a little bit of background perspective, on who we are and where we are. 
Um, I know there's a Torrance County out there, uh, but that's not us. <laughs> um, we are in California. Uh, just specifically, we're the sixth largest city in LA County. We have about 20.5 square miles. Our population ranges, um, according to the census data, we have 147,000 roughly residents, uh, nighttime residents within the city. And our daytime population is roughly 250,000. It does fluctuate based on the uh, different types of corporations and personnel that come in and go throughout our city. We're south of Redondo Beach. Um, many of you have heard of Redondo. If you haven't heard of Torrance, maybe you've heard of Redondo. Um, and we're 16 miles from downtown Los Angeles. Um, we are a balanced city, and that's really something that's in the logo of our, our city emblem. But we, have, we provide all of our services in-house. We're considered full service. We have our own police and fire departments, including our fire department being a class one department. Uh, we do have our own unified school district, which is unique. We are separate from LAUSD. We have 43 schools, um, elementary and middle schools, and four high schools. Uh, we also are home to the Delamo Fashion Center, which is the second largest mall in America, um, right behind Mall of America. We have one and a half miles of coastal line, which is a little unique because not a lot of people realize that Torrance does have a beach. Uh, we, are, we do have a refinery in our city. It's the Exxon Mobil refinery. Um, and that's what we're, we're going to talk about that incident today. We have a reservoir about 700, um, actually, the, I'm sorry, the refinery is 750 acres. Um, we do have a reservoir. We also have an airport, a non-commercial airport. We're home to the North American Honda headquarters. Also, Toyota Motor, USA North American headquarters. We do have the rail tracks that run right through our city and Interstate 405. Um, many of you may have heard, if you're not in California, of the 405 with Carmageddon, or what they called it when they shut the 405 down a few years ago. Um, and we also have active fault lines, including the Newport Inglewood fault line that run, run through our city. Um, right now, I'm going to turn it over to our Deputy Fire Chief. He's going to talk a little bit about um, our previous notification systems and where kind of where we came from um, with the consent decree. Dave? Thanks, Aria. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, it's David Dumay, I'm Deputy Fire Chief for the City of Torrance. Um, back in the early 90s, um, the uh, City of Torrance uh, basically, and, and, the ex and the Mobile Corporation at the time, uh, entered into some uh, legal issues. And what came out of those issues was a consent decree which basically um, set guidelines and um, awareness and responsibilities for the city of Torrance, uh, namely the fire department and the, the mobile, mobile refinery to work together uh, in handling emergencies. Um, out of that consent decree uh, became some community warning uh, procedures that we still have in place uh, today. Um, we have a a community warning siren that actually sounds in the event of a major uh, release or emergency at or near the refinery. Uh, and that's a siren that's basically on the outskirts of the refinery property um, uh, as it goes. Um, the radio alert network is, um, is a system that sends uh, uh, shortwave uh, radio to radio receivers throughout the community. And we focused on uh, populations that are near to the refinery and to the school district as well. In addition to that, uh, we also have a mass notification system that uh, uh, used to be various vendors uh, from the inception. And we have morphed to now include uh, the Everbridge system, which we call Torrance Alerts. In addition to the consent decree, which I'll add, which may not be on the slide, is uh, some of the operational things that we do every day. And one of the most important things we do is we unify command. We unify at every position in the uh, incident command system from the EOC all the way out to um, the incident themselves. I like to say we, we have a, an ExxonMobil person. Uh, and the Torrance fire person all the way from the EOC all the way to the end of the, the hose line. And what that does is it helps uh, communicate, uh, helps with communications all the way up, up and down through the, um, through the system. In addition to that, we have um, exercises with ExxonMobil and with uh, the refinery. 
as well as, like I stated, we have common communications um, and, and a very rigorous um, description of what incidents happen at the refinery and how we respond and how we um, work with them. Um, You know, our goal has always been to get out the right message at the right time to the right person, uh, get the um, uh, residents and the community involved, um, instill that two-way dialogue. The refinery has been, been doing really well at, at notifying the community uh, as far as what happens uh, on, on a daily day basis, and try to instill the trust and confidence both in refinery operations, but then that the local police and fire and emergency responders can respond efficiently and effectively and um, bring whatever the incident is to some sense of, of normalcy. Um, so just to bring us back to where kind of uh, chief, the chief talked about kind of where we were, but understanding that if we don't use the system often enough, um, it doesn't become second nature. So trying to identify the needs on where, how we move forward, we were looking for a system that really provided automated content that didn't require um, essentially relying on call trees, et cetera. So we, were, we wanted an automated system, something web-based, uh, redundancy. Uh, we needed something that we could integrate into our daily operations, and we, that was really a lesson learned from how we previously um, functioned over the past decade or so. Um, getting that into and ingrained in daily operations is critical, especially because when something does happen, then it doesn't become this new system we've never used. Um, we also needed something that provided geocoding for maps and pictures and zones as well. Um, prior to conversion uh, with our new system, how we performed, we did a lot of internal communication. So it was, it, we really solely relied on email and fax. And then um, our external system uh, that the chief discussed before was really a pay-per-use notification system. So in the event that we had to activate or send a mass notification, we did, it was a pay-per-use system. So it wasn't something that we could use for frequency of notifications um, often because it, it obviously it started to get costly as it, we started moving forward. Um, we also heavily relied on the Nixle system. It's a public safety-centric um, system. Uh, many of you might be familiar with it. Police departments use it often, but that was how we were communicating non-emergency messaging throughout the city. Okay. If I could add just some uh, internal issues that we have as a, as a fire service, and, and uh, you know, our staff is, is pretty much operational heavy, and so we rely a lot, a great deal, on emergency services from Soraya's office and from the police department, um, watch commanders, and uh, officers in charge. So that, that's also a, a challenge for us uh, to have those that are not wearing the firefighter badge to understand the messages that, that we need to get out. So, so moving forward, we're doing some extensive training and, and basically saying, if we want to put a message out, we send it to X individual, and it's put out without any, any um, uh, filters because the subject matter experts need to get the information out as quickly as possible. And then if they have an issue with what gets sent out, we talk about that later. Um, the other piece, we, so I briefly touched on our, our internal. We relied solely on email and phone list. Um, we didn't have a lot of redundancy. Um, from an emergency management perspective, obviously, that's what gives you agile and keeps you up at night. So um, that was one thing that, was, um, that we focused on in terms of moving forward. Also, public notification, we talked about a pay-per-use system, um, we ha and we had two separate systems, essentially. Um, and we, the Nixle, again, was public safety-centric. It was really limited in the ability for the, um, customer, for the to provide good customer data. So a lot of people opt into Nixle by just texting their zip code to 888777, which from an emergency manager perspective didn't provide a lot of insight as to who that customer was, where they were located, what types of needs they needed. Um, so that was really um, something that was challenging for us. What made us decide on Everbridge, um, there's the obvious, obviously, that the, it was a good investment. You guys have a, from an investment perspective, um, you do a lot of investment in product improvement, and that was important in talking with the other cities that have used your services, um, case studies. Um, but more importantly, I think um, than anything, it's the partner agencies and the partnerships 
um, and their use of the system. Um, obviously, we have neighboring cities that use Everbridge, but also all, all of the LA County hospitals um, have an agreement with Everbridge, which is crucial when we talk about interoperability and communication to ensure that the right people are getting that message. And having our neighboring communities on the system as well helps a lot. Um, the system's interactive. It provides two-way dialogue. Um, like we, I had mentioned before, it targets the person, not the device. Um, and more importantly, we are, it's a one system, not just for in, external use, but also for internal. Um, so, and we wanted to integrate that into our daily operations. So we have a system that we've essentially titled Torrance Alerts. Um, we actually had, we converted from our old system to Everbridge in December. And we had to phase it. And I know if anybody of you on the call have done implementation with the system, you understand, or any system, it's a multifaceted process. And there's lots of different pieces. And to do a flip the switch turn immediately overnight to do everything you want the system to do is not realistic. So we really had to phase the process. So phase one was really getting the critical, crucial E911 information and data into the system. And that we did um, with our IT department and getting the information moved from the old system into the new system. Our E911 data consists of Verizon and AT&T. Um, and we pull that data once a quarter. And that's how we update the residential hardline phones within the city. Phase two was the internal communications part, so putting all of our notification groups into the system. Um, we had two, prior to this incident, we had two systems for notification. We had a public safety notification group and then a management paging system. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about how we've done a criteria-driven notification um, system that really is allowing us for more specific um, messaging for different types of incidents about the city. The third phase, which we weren't there yet, um, when we had this incident at the Exxon Mobil refinery, was the public opt-in, um, the outreach program that was phased and slated to start this summer. Um, this event kind of jump-started that process. Um, but different types of categories that we were looking at were obviously the traffic alerts, transit delays, you know, targeting mar farmers markets, um, community alerts and events, access to functional needs, um, et cetera. Then the last phase of this process is the RAN conversion that the chief talked about before. Um, getting everybody who has those RAN radios without, within the city to opt into the system um, and then to do some uh, layering with the map so that we have our different quadrants of the city where those areas are identified so that we can specifically target message those individuals based on those geocoded maps. So we're going to just briefly walk through, just to give you some background um, of the incident that we had in February, just so that you have a little bit of background and understanding of what um, what we were, what we saw on scene, and what we were being told, um, and how then that drove the messaging that followed. So I'm going to turn it over to the chief. He's going to walk us through the initial onset and then the calls that um, subsequently came in after that. On the 18th of February, it was a uh, normal day in the city of Torrance, 65 degrees, a little overcast, kind of like it is today, uh, only a little bit warmer. Uh, barely, barely any wind, really, to, to speak of. Um, and that's, uh, for any of the emergency responders, that's important uh, because you want to know, uh, especially in a hazardous materials or a large um, smoke or fire incident, where the, where, the, where the stuff, where the odors, where the product may be going. Uh, the call came in to the Public Safety Dispatch Center uh, at about 10 minutes to 9 in the morning. Uh, and our normal response is a, is a first alarm response to any, any incident that when we determine that it's an actual emergency, we upgrade to a second alarm. Uh, initial companies came out of, their, uh, out of their stations, two reasons. One, because they got an alarm, and two, because they heard and felt the explosion. Uh, and the explosion was, was um, measured as a, a, a 1.7 on the local Richter scale. So it was something that was uh, definitely out of the ordinary. Second alarm came through. Units uh, started arriving on scene. Initial companies reported smoke uh, at the front gate. And as I stated earlier, establish a unified command with, with the Exxon Mobil uh, Fire Gate personnel. Um, Initially, speaking to the Exxon Mobil folks, uh, the explosion was in the uh, electrostatic precipitator, 
which is basically a scrubber, which scrubs uh, uh, pollutants and things in the refinery process that then get pushed to the atmosphere. Uh, there was an initial ground fire that was quickly ext extinguished by ExxonMobil personnel, but the but major damage to the ESP unit um, and the and part of the upstream side of the ESP unit is and downstream side, sorry is uh, the creation of gasoline. So we had some gasoline leaks. Um, one, two of them we were able to take care of fairly quickly. The other one was a, a longer period of time because of the, uh, the amount of pressures and the amount of uh, uh, damage that was done. Initially, we have reports of injuries. And due to the explosion, uh, they actually had some pre-warnings with some monitors that went off. So they, they were actually able to evacuate the area. But like anything else, uh, people trying to scramble out of the way uh, definitely got some bumps and bruises. Those were taken care of by on-scene medical staff. They were not treated nor uh, evaluated by fire department personnel. And that, that's one of the action items we, we found out. All of the patients, regardless of severity, need to go through um, medical division um, and through the unified command. Uh, it was about three, three to six injuries that, that were reported, but uh, again, those were were not evaluated by ExxonMobil uh, towards fire personnel. Knowing the unit, uh, we understood what the product was. Uh, and uh, with our hazardous materials team, uh, normal operations is to monitor with our, our um, combustible gas monitors to determine, because it is a, a petroleum refinery, generally combustible flammable gases are, are or let go in any type of leak or an explosion. Uh, our hazardous materials team monitored the fence line. Nothing was getting outside the fence. We had no readings at any of the at any of the fence line. Um, and again, you know, we were focusing on you know the explosion. It was a little bit later that we started to um, to to get uh, some some outside notif notification that uh, there was some product that was was put a, put up in the air. Internally, uh, and with the refinery, part of the, one part of the uh, consent decree was um, street barriers that were put into place. So on one side, which would be the south side of the refinery, uh, due to the uh, little wind that there was, we, we closed uh, the south street uh, south of the refinery. The, the street that's right next to the refinery uh, to the east wasn't closed because there was no uh, measurable, flammable, nor uh, combustible gases, so we left that street open. And you can see a, real quickly a couple flares. And flares are a good thing in the refinery business, so uh, it's a pressure relief valve. As I stated uh, a little bit ago, there wasn't much wind, uh, and the readings that were coming through through the gas, combustible gas, flammable gas monitors were, were nothing. So we're thinking, okay, we got a pretty good handle on it. But we started to get some of these off-site reports that, that said there's something coming down. And so um, with some scouts, we sent out some, some field resources to try to figure out what it was that was, was out there. Um, and as it turned out, the uh, ESP uh, does use some catalyst that uh, basically takes the um, uh, electricity out of the product. And that one was propelled up into the air. It was it was reported as as ash, almost like an ash, and it started to go up in the air. And unbeknownst to us and the responders, that it was up there. When it started coming down, we started getting 911 calls into dispatch, and then we had to start dealing with that offsite uh, an incident as well, because the onsite incident was pretty much uh, taking care of itself. As far as notification goes, um, uh, again. Uh, we, we were in transition with uh, Everbridge at this time. We had a Nixle system in place, and we had our former provider with a mass notification data still in place. But we were still, uh, I tell people that Murphy came to town at, at maybe the wrong time, but it, it lessons learned it was, it was maybe a good time because uh, we were able to, to find out some of the uh, early challenges with, with the system. Um, the NICS alert was sent out as a, a, a method of, of notifying the community. Um, we did have some challenges with information not going through the incident commander. And those that deal with incident command, uh, lessons learned from us 
all information that gets put out through the to the community has to get vetted by the incident commander. Um, I was I was deemed the notification officer for the incident, so information that was put out from the IC to me got sent out to various folks uh, through emergency management through Soraya um, and uh, through the school district. It was other avenues that got thrown out that didn't have the same message, and that was a little confusing uh, throughout the incident. One one area I just wanted to highlight because it's on this slide um, when we did the conversion and we took our pre-recorded templates and messages and converted them into the Everbridge system, um, we took those template message or those message templates and used those for the incident. However, not truly understanding the different complexity of this system from our old system, we did modify the messaging. Well, a lot of those messages had already voice recordings associated with them. Now, the voice when we modified the actual message that went out, um, the voice recording should have been deleted because it didn't reflect the actual message that was being sent. So when we sent those messages, they were truly precautionary shelter-in-place messaging, but because that voice recording was not deleted, it sent a text and email uh, message that said precautionary, but then it also had the voice that said mandatory. So that was a big com piece of confusion between the messaging um, that we've learned from, again, looking at the old system into the new system that we've had to make modifications to. And in the past, with our former vendors, we had set up uh, in the fire department, because majority of the usage for the mass notification system was, one, due to the refinery operations and, and mishaps that happened at the refinery. So we pre-recorded and pre-wrote messages um, uh, with our prior vendor. And getting some of those messages over was a little bit of a challenge. So, And again, Murphy came to town at, at a time when we were kind of in transition. So we kind of went with what we had in the box already, so to speak. Um, the media was a big um, uh, event uh, because they have resources we don't. Uh, messages through uh, helicopter, radio, television. Um, they even had um, news vans in the center median of, of a major um, uh, street. But Everything associated with an, with an oil petroleum refinery is very political these days, and we all understand why. So a lot of messages get, got sent out through media, which in turn we weren't ahead of in the uh, in, uh, information officer uh, uh, joint information center type system. We, we, we missed that ball, and, and that was one, another one of the uh, uh, after action things that we need to get better at. Social media, um, again, challenging on, on some parts with the fire department. Police department has a, a more robust staff with sending out, but people themselves started tweeting and started sending out messages themselves and sharing information uh, live uh, from downwind, uh, as, as some of these slides will show. Um, they started talking about ash and, and what's going on. and and things of that nature. So again, we, we've learned to monitor social media and get some of the intel where we're actually getting intel from, from the community. Some lessons learned for, for crisis communications, um, the three C's, clear, concise, consistent, um, anticipate the impact of the city. You know, one of the things, and I'll stop for a second, we thought we had the community fairly well trained, but in some community forums, a lot of the community were asking questions. Why wasn't the siren um, uh, activated? What does it mean when the siren's activated? What does it mean to shelter in place? And we thought we had a good handle on, on some of that information. So now we're going back and we're, we're looking ourselves in the mirror and say, how are we going to get this information back out? So we're developing strategies moving forward for uh, more community outreach reach at the same time as now that we have Torrance Alerts. Uh, that we get people signed up for the, the pre-registration uh, as well. And then, and then there's two sides of, of sending information out. You have the very close, near impact area that, that hears, sees, smells something happening at a facility, and then you got six, seven, eight, ten miles away who hears something that's not affected, but their friend sent them a, 
a text or a tweet that says, hey, something's going on. And so those people want to know. So you get the quandary of sending the near message and then the mass message. And the near message might be shelter in place. And then the, the uh, mass message may be as, as an awareness. So we're, we're fighting that battle and getting that information out to the community moving forward as well. And the other piece of that is, is regardless of what happens, we've, we're doing training for all of the people who have the ability to send community messages to, you have to send two messages if it's that large of a community impact for every event. Um, because there will always be, again, the people that hear about it and they start tweeting about it. And as you all, I'm sure all understand, social media is a gigantic, enormous monster if you don't control it. Um, and so to be able to try and get ahead of that message, again, doing that two message component with every public message, emergency message that we send, is crucial. Because we didn't get ahead of the message on the front end. We were inundated with calls. Um, and again, w watching social media, dispatch was overwhelmed with calls, really prevented us from, uh, it, we, we could have done ourselves a better service by doing that as well. Um, you know, the lessons learned as far as emergency management perspective, um, trying to get the right information out uh, at the right time to the right folks um, is crucial. However, if we don't put anything out, people are going to make up their own stories. And so what we have to do is we have to put out, especially from the government side, we have to put out that, hey, something happened, we're investigating, we'll get more information to you. And then we'll do that, you know, in another uh, 10 or 15 minutes and, and, and try to get that out there. Uh, and then continue to send a little bit more information out there. It's not secret, you know, there was an explosion. You know, we didn't know for the first 20 minutes that there was some, some fallout that was way up in the air due to, the, to the, uh, uh, this, this ball of ash that was put in the air. We didn't know until it started coming down. Then that's more information that, that needs to keep, keep coming out. Um, one of the, the, the biggest one of the biggest stakeholders that we spoke to and I had direct contact with the school, was the school districts and I had direct contact with um, the, the school district superintendent had him on my cell phone and tell him exactly what was happening and basically tell him the near near area schools we were going to make them have them shelter he kept getting different information from different resources and he was questioning what the information that I was giving him. So I had to guarantee to him that I was getting information directly from the incident commander. And that's another critical critical piece that all those ancillary folks that keep coming at your, your stakeholders, you have to point them back to whoever's, whoever's the point person from the incident commander, that's where you're getting all the, the pertinent direct information. You know, the, I think the challenge too when sending emergency notifications is people really you, I mean, we take it seriously, so we want to ensure that the information we're putting out is accurate, it's correct. And I think the one thing that we've talked about is the information was accurate, not timely. Um, and so when we say don't, put, don't wait to put information out, even if it's a simple message that you send out that says we're aware of the situation, we're responding to the incident, we will provide information when it's available. Just by putting that out, you're going to deter a lot of people from starting to fish around for information. And then even if we have nothing else to report 15 minutes later, put the same information out because it ensures that confidence and it instills that trust, again, with the community that, yeah, hey, listen, you don't need to call us. We're aware of it. We're responding. We'll, as we get information, we will update you. Um, the other piece that we really focused on for that first hour is to continually send messages every 15 minutes. And even if it's not all anything new, if you send that message every 15 minutes, it ensures that you're on top of that information. It provides the community an interface with you to say we are we're aware of it, we're working on it, etc. Um, it will prevent you your, you from getting inundated with calls. The other piece that uh, we again in the back end of things um, are to create templates in the system that you'll use and have information cues for public messaging. For, and also internal messaging that you can populate. Things like that the community wants to know, um, for example, where media staging is located. Um, media is, is an opt-in. They've opted into our system. They're getting these messages as well. 
So we really can use the media and leverage the media to really get the message out if used appropriately. So making sure that we have those information cues, especially like um, naming the incident. I mean, early on, had we used a, a correct hashtag naming convention um, for this incident, we could have then driven the message when it derailed. Um, because then we could have titled it sooner, we could have then tried to correct the message on the back end. So understanding that using those templates, pulling them down, because it could be someone who has not a lot of experience using the system, and having that cue, that, that template that they can then follow, will cue them into thinking about things that they, have, you know, be it a watch commander or battalion chief, might not be thinking about that larger, bigger picture. So having those cues for them is essential. Um, the other piece that we looked at um, was all responding agencies have to participate in Unified Command, period. There, there has to be a central point um, for all of public messaging and all the responding units. Um, given the proximity of the, the refinery to um, our city operations, um, we need to have a piece of accountability as well. Um, given that it, it truly was, a, it was across the street from our, our physical EOC location, um, so we were still truly considered part of the hot zone. Um, we've mentioned and we've talked about joint messaging. Um, every piece of information needs to go through a JIC. It should stem through a JIC to prevent confusion and mixed messaging. Um, we had issues with AQMD releasing information that was not accurate after we had sent an all clear. They were still advising um, a, a air quality issue, um, issues with, again, internally with messaging, um, LA County Health Hazmat, again, ensuring that all of those responding agencies, their PIOs are part of a JIC that, so that that information is consistent across every agency so there is no confusion and you're not trying to chase the, chase the message on the back end. Um, the other piece that was actually interesting that we had never thought about was the request for emergency messaging from the incident commander came through cell phones, everybody's in the field, everybody's using cell phones. However, we've had an issue trying to reenact the incident on the back end with what time things were requested or actually done. Um, there were things in the system we could pull when messages were sent, but what time did that actual request go in? What time was the message authorized? Um, we, again, we can speculate, we can look at our phone records, but we needed to have some type of timestamp. We were very, very fortunate that this didn't turn into a bigger incident than it was and that nobody was seriously injured or killed. But had there been, from an evidence collection perspective, having that timestamp go through our public safety dispatch, would then, we'd then have a voice recording of what time it was requested, the message that was then to be sent. There's more of an accountability perspective with that. I mentioned the EOC was in the hot zone. So we needed the capacity to have a virtual EOC, especially because we were asking those to take precautionary shelter. Um, any of you, most of you know you can't, if you've got to physically go somewhere, um, if we're asking you to precautionary shelter, and then we're activating the EOC and asking you to come to the EOC, um, obviously that's a conflicting information. So having the ability to do a virtual EOC was essential, and, and we really didn't have that ability to do that at that time. Um, we talked about media staging and how critical that was. Um, providing, again, using the media as an outlet to get the information out. Regardless of that, whoever's agenda with the media, they can be your best friend. Uh, because in the interest of public safety, they all, we all have the same thing in common. We want the right message out at the right time. So um, establishing a media staging area immediately, determine where that's going to be, um, especially for high profile media type of events. Um, you can direct them to an area, you provide them information frequently, and then provide them follow-up. I'm going to be back in an hour to provide you another update. Um, so that they're, now you're driving the message, you're giving them that information, and then they're in turn turning and giving that to the public. We discussed the sirens, um, why they were not utilized. Again, goes back to public education. The threshold was not met, but the public expected it. They expected the sirens to go off. So looking at education is absolutely crucial. It's key on the back end. What does it mean to shelter in place? When those sirens go off, what does that mean? What is the expected action? Um, 
it means something different. And what we're finding is everyone in the community has a different perspective of what shelter in place means, which is interesting because, again, we thought we had done the education. So um, we have to be more specific as to what the expected action is in a shelter in place. What does that mean? And being more directive in that messaging to this is what it means, this is what you should do. Oh, and for more information, please visit or please call or providing another outlet because just saying shelter in place clearly has very different meaning to very different people. And if what, you know, shelter in place because X, Y, and Z, we need to be more specific. Then the other thing you have to think about it are your contiguous cities. Like, we, just because it happens in Torrance doesn't mean it doesn't float over the border. Um, so you, we've got to think about how we're then notifying. Again, we're talking about our city and notification of our city, but turning in we, we always tell people, if you live, work, play, visit, anything in the city of Torrance, I don't, we, we don't care if you live here or not. We want to be able to capture you and send you information. And so thinking about how we can then integrate our public safety agencies, our other governments, our partners um, that are within, within and around our city, how do we get that communication message to them? Because just you could be passing by on you know, your car and you then how do we then communicate those, those messages? We don't want people from other cities coming into our city if there's truly an emergency where we're, we're telling people to shelter in place. The other piece that um, is actually interesting that we figured out was um, something that was different for us. It was NICFL, when we had sent information, when we would send information, it came across automatically as Torrent PD. Um, so there was no issue as to, it, again, it said, Triple A, Triple Seven, but it always said Torrance PD automatically. Well, with um, the Everbridge system, it doesn't do that. It comes across, and I've highlighted that here as a five-digit number. Well, we had issues with people not answering phones because they didn't recognize the number, not answering um, a text because they didn't understand, they didn't recognize or associate that number with an emergency. And so, what we have told people is number one save this number to your contact so that when you get a, a text message, you then see Torrance Alerts, and that's the naming convention we're using. But also, additionally, when we're sending that message, we have to label the message in the title of the message, Torrance Alerts, and then we have to identify if it's an internal message or a public message. And that is the template and customization that we've had to do on our end to ensure that there's consistency so that the receiver, the resident, the opt-in member, is then seeing that and then recognizing the seriousness of the message that's being sent. So more of a, I guess, compliance perspective from our community, and that's essential on creating that, that getting that information out there. Um, the other piece is we needed to have determined where the community can call for more information. Everything was being directed to Exxon uh, Mobile at the time, but where we as a city have a, an obligation to be able to provide or give more information out to the public. So this is, a, it's set a, I mean, it, we learned this in the aftermath of this incident, but the call out line that we used um, was initially set up as part of implementation, which, which was my office. <laughs> so everyone tried to call my office back, which essentially just maxed my voicemail out. Um, and interestingly enough, um, we were, were actually doing some critical analyzing of the call volume that day um, because we need to be able to handle roughly 30 to 50 percent of people calling us back um, because either people don't answer their phones because they don't recognize the number and then they call it back to find out who it was. Um, and we don't, our, at least our infrastructure um, in terms of Verizon, well, talking with Verizon and AT&T, cannot handle we sent 85,000 messages out. We could not handle 30,000 messages coming in at once. So we are looking for different options. Um, we call it the IVR solutions. Um, it's interactive voice response. So what message then can people call back? Because re regardless, people are going to call that number that called them, especially if they aren't sure, they don't have enough information. They're going to call that number that provided them that emergency message back. So we then, on our end, have to determine what it, it, obviously, we can't have a person answering all those calls. So we are looking for a, an option where that line could then refer to a cloud-based virtual voicemail that would then say, "Thank you for calling Torrance Alerts. Um, this is, you know, 
automated system that basically then would refer them to options to get additional information. Because that's the reality, um, and you can you overwhelm your infrastructure very quickly unless you have something in that process. The call out line has to be customized. Um, people, a lot, again, aren't answering with all the telemarketers and robocalling. People aren't answering numbers they don't recognize. So we're working on actually having it say the city of Torrance so that when it comes across, they come across in landlines, but they don't come across in cell phones. And so that's something that we're working with our, comp our, our telephone providers and customizing so that there's a, a higher probability for those people to answer their phones. The other piece that you need to ensure is you've got customization for high priority and non-priority calls. We had not set those up yet, and they were just generic, this is an emergency message, not this is an emergency message from the city of Torrance, which would have helped our, I guess, back end um, response and doing the analyzing on those people who had then answered the call or confirmed that they received that message. Ensure your call throttling is on and engaged. It's so essential, especially in the implementation and setup. Our system can handle more than 9,999 calls a minute going out. Um, so understand what your maximum threshold is. I think it's 10,000, so we did one below. Um, so ensure, find out what that call, what you need to have in place, because if you try and send 85,000 messages all at once, obviously that's not going to work, and there's going to then the system then gets overwhelmed and overloaded and there's a delay in that messaging. Save your shapes when using your maps um, to send messages. That was probably the one thing um, we learned on the back end is when we sent that initial message, we didn't save the shape. Um, so the subsequent messages were scientific guesses based on, or estimations based on what we had done um, previous. So we just kept expanding our polygon which then created a lot of confusion because those that got the initial, those that got the second message never received the initial message of um, the shelter. So they got the second message of all clear and they had never gotten the shelter in place message initially. So save those because it's critical because then you can go back and use that shape. Um, and then for text messaging, always use a title indicator, torrent alerts, whatever you're calling it, um, so that those people recognize that, that number, that message that's being sent to them as what it is. Um, after action item improvements, again, we talked about pre-populated templates. This is just an example of something we put together internally um, for us to send our internal messaging, um, the things that we need to cover in that initial message that we're sending out to our, in, our internal keep, um, stakeholders so that we have an idea of what's going on. It also prompts others. Again, if you're arriving on scene, if you're an incident commander, it's now prompting you to think through, I may need these things. I may need additional resources. I need to identify staging. Um, and thinking beyond the initial incident, what the potential uh, impact could be to the city. Um, we've also talked to, and we've implemented now um, an EOC. We basically have a tiered system for our EOC activation. Um, our, again, before we had talked about the public notification and the map, the management paging system as two systems, but they were not directly associated or linked with EOC activation. So what we've done is we've actually looked at a tiered system, and it's directly tied to activation of the EOC and public messaging. And that's crucial because now we have a mechanism to escalate if needed, but also now there's a process around specific criteria in the community and then activation of our EOC. And a lot of it is discretionary based on the who's in, who's the, um, the incident commander is, and it's, we made it vague for that reason, um, so that they can use their um, subject matter expertise to make that decision based on the incident. But a key piece of this is for any incident that's really large in, in scale, we're using a, we call it a standby activation, and it's a conference call of our key officials within the city. So we're talking about the IC on scene, our city manager, our chief. The PIOs, everybody's going to get on a call initially at a standby activation to determine what do we know, what do we not know, and what do we do. Do we activate, do we escalate the, the activation and activate a JIC to help with managing, again, if it was an incident like we had at Exxon, activating a JIC to manage the public messaging, because truly at the end of the day that's really all it was. Um, that would have been essential and key for us. Um, but being able to get those key stakeholders on a conference call um, 
by doing a standby activation is crucial. And I'll talk about some of the different events we've used that for and how beneficial it's been. But again, um, looking at the different tiered activations and associating that with the actual activation of the EFC is crucial. The other piece that we are, we're actually building out right now is doing notifications based on position, not per, um, per people, persons, um, so that when we do notifications, we now have them grouped as their position titles in the EOC, and then we have alternates. And so we're using this uh, call escalation piece in the system to then identify, once I've activated the EOC and determined what positions I need, I then identify the position that's needed and I send a notification, and it's going to escalate the call based on how I've configured it in the system to pick the, whoever answered the, essentially it's going to start calling down, and whoever's answering, once they confirm, it'll stop trying to fill that position. So using it to do a escalation so that I'm not on the phone trying to call five people who are then going to call five other people that are going to call five more, um, it's very targeted, it, targeted and very specific. Um, the biggest challenge I think that a lot of cities face with activations of their ESC is it's, it's kind of like an all call. We activate and everybody comes and we activate and only half of them come um, based on who's getting the notification and there's not a lot of descriptive information or details of where we need them to go, what we need them to do. Um, so by tiering the system based on positions and determining the positions that are needed when we activate, and then having all of that configured. Again, you have to have a name, associated, different names associated with positions and information. But again, the system then automatically identifies um, when it's sending that message who is then is being, um, who's filling that position so that I don't get five people who could potentially be my logistics chief. I don't need five people, I need one. And I'd like to save my other four, especially if it's a long event, for maybe the next operational um, period. So that's that's essential, and we're really working through that right now. Um, this, again, just it gives you a screenshot of kind of what we're doing. It talks about the levels, the criteria, um, the notification. We focus on the EOZ position title, what that process looks like, the expected action, and then what the expected action is off-duty. So the big piece, too, here with us is now we're, we're actually asking for a response. Um, so we want them to confirm it because we want to know who's getting that message on the back end, if they've received it, what they've said. Um, so there's a, that's a big learning curve um, from before. A lot of the notifications we have been sending prior to this conversion never required a response. And so from a, excuse me, a tracking perspective, that's been crucial because now we can pull who was notified and when and what their response was. Um, the other piece that we've developed, um, we've created a social media handle for our mass notification system. Um, it, it's at Torrance Alerts, um, Twitter and Facebook handles. And essentially what happens is, is when we get to a certain activation level, it activates the city PIO to then become the central point of messaging. And Torrance Alerts, the Twitter and Facebook handles, then feed all city pages. So the, um, there was a lot of inconsistency in terms of updating on social media throughout the event. Fire was, they were the command on, they were running the incident, this was their scene. So all the other city pages took a seat back and waited for Fire's direction in terms of public messaging on social media. Now, at this level where we activate the JIC, the city PIO then has the authority to, if they'd like to delegate, but it becomes one piece, one voice from the city, and Torrance Alerts then feeds all of our social media sites. And we've had to use a third-party app exchange to integrate the social media component into our messaging for the public, which, to be very honest, has been very challenging um, because I'm not an IT person, and I've had to really, I've had to learn how this works and how the uh, how it picks up a, a word and a link and then forwards. Um, so they're called webhooks, and I don't know up until. I started fooling with this. I had no idea what a webhook was, and I think I'm social media savvy, so that was actually a challenge for me. Um, we also have an email account um, created for community feedback or to report issues with the system. It's at Torrance, you know, Torrance Alerts and the generic email for our city. And that way people who have issues with the system, um, can't get in, get locked out, have problems, don't understand, um, can then email that general account. and then we are able to either forward it or escalate it to the appropriate person to then handle it or deal with that issue, but also monitor and send them feedback. And we've gotten some great feedback through that system. But then it also provides the community a link to say, hey, listen, if you need more information, 
you don't just have to call a number. You can actually email someone and get a response. So there's a, that, again, that paper trail for follow-up. Okay, um, I just want to move it. I know we're running out of time here, but I want to talk about, I know I'm totally out of time now that I look at my, uh, <laughs> at the time. I just want to briefly talk about the South Bay oil spill that we had um, and just how we used it just quickly. Um, information obviously was, is fragmented in the beginning. There were multiple reports coming in. Um, they established unified command relatively quickly, which was essential in terms of messaging. Um, lessons that we learned, um, anybody who has a beach understands there's challenges. It's not just the city, there's the Coast Guard, there's LA, or your county health department. Um, for us, it was the U.S. Coast Guard, LA County Health, uh, LA county health Hazmat, LA County Fire De um, Department lifeguards. They manage the county beaches. They're the actual lifeguard agency. And then you have all your cities that bud up to the beaches. So there's a lot of different agencies in working. So who has the authority to open and close the beach, and what is that criteria? And that was something that we learned um, throughout this oil spill incident that, um, interestingly enough, for oil and those types of incidents, the county health department doesn't have the authority to close the beach. If it was bio-related, they did, but for oil, they didn't. Um, that was the Coast Guard. So, and then it, it was interesting. It was a very unique situation because we didn't know who essentially had the ultimate authority to close the beach. And the messages that were being sent was the health department had closed the beaches. Uh, the other piece is they, were kept, they kept saying Torrance Beach is closed, which was interesting. And we talk about media messaging and correcting that message. Um, and Torrance Beach was actually never closed, which we actually, I think, did a good job of getting that message out. Unified Command, they coordinated the communication between LA County Health Hazmat and all the different agencies. Um, dispatched, we internally dispatched our Torrance Fire and Police Department to Torrance Beach for observation. Um, we hadn't had reports of, of tar and oil on our beach. Um, but again, we, I, there's not an invisible barrier in the middle of the ocean, so we anticipated it was probably coming our way soon. Um, the unified, again, putting unified command was essential because it, it, you gathered that information a lot faster and easier, and um, we were able to then put that message out. We did use the opt-in portal. We sent non-safety related messages just to, to provide information to over 3,000 residents. We provided follow-up. We provided those reporting lines, web resources, and instructions. Um, Torrance Beach was never closed, despite what the media reported. They kept saying Torrance Beach is closed, and Torrance Beach was never closed. So we were all we kept putting information out there very quickly, saying the, again, Torrance Beach remains open. Unified Command did work well between the cities. We felt, um, and messaging was consistent pretty much across all corresponding agencies, despite what the media kept reporting for us. And I think a, bit, a big misnomer is Torrance Beach is often grouped in with Redondo. So they don't, um, have, they, they, it's, there's a hard differentiation between the two. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about the thunderstorms we had here in LA last weekend. Um, we, again, it was part of a cyclone, um, cyclone Dolores that was downgraded. Um, we got hit, I know it's a joke, we got rain and everybody freaks out in LA, but we really did get rain and everybody did freak out in LA. It was as if they'd never seen it before. Um, and we, using the hashtag LA rain, it was just kind of funny. Um, there was thunder, significant thunder and lightning throughout Southern California. Um, the, th the thunder was so intense, it was actually setting car alarms off. And there was a lot of lightning at the beaches. Um, there was lots of flooding, rela uh, flooding related incidents um, across Southern California. And it, they're saying, I guess the National Weather Service is saying, it's what is July on record in Southern California. Um, I know that, I mean, it's kind of a joke, the cars, but that's truly what things look like. <laughs> um, the rainfall totals that are on there, I know if you're in other parts of the country, you're probably laughing at us saying, you guys have got to be kidding me. But truly, when it hasn't rained here in years, um, that's a big deal. And especially when it comes down that fast, um, in such a short period of time, it causes problems. The lightning, were, the lightning strikes, they ignited, they took out transformers, they lit palm trees on fire. Um, and I think we were hyper vigilant because last year in Venice, a lightning strike did kill someone um, at the beaches. So, but it, and it happened at a very odd time. It was like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it was 80 degrees, muggy. It was beautiful that morning, so everyone was on the beach. And so we were trying to stay ahead of things um, by putting messaging out. Um, the biggest challenge we had was it was hard to get ahead or get control of the message on the front end because 
the county lifeguard closed all LA County beaches, um, but we weren't brought into the loop until public messaging was already released to the media. Now, from an agency coordination perspective, that becomes a problem because we aren't aware of the situation and then we're being questioned on it. But we also didn't put out any information because the news repeated, reported it first and then we then um, got the information. Um, our watch commander and battalion chief determined it was a public safety threat um, due to the proximity, time, um, location, and we did issue a torrent alert to all 104,000 um, E911 residents in the area. It went through um, calls, through landlines, but also through the opt-ins, through text messaging. Um, other incidents that we have had, just briefly, we had an incident in ExxonMobil, um, and after I came down on everybody about messaging, um, we had actually oversent messages and got complaints, but you know what, at least we were oversending messages. Told them every 15 minutes you send a message. Um, it was a non-event and it wasn't anything to be reported um, about. We also have an Armed Forces Day Parade. We did internal and community updates to the opt-in registrants. It's actually the largest parade west of the Mississippi um, ongoing parade um, in, in May that we do. We also, for the 4th of July, um, down here at the beaches in the South Bay, we get inundated with um, people at the beach. So we actually use conference calls every four hours and two hour internal um, email updates to provide our internal stakeholders on what was going on. We also get ahead of it by putting out external messaging to the community to alert them that, hey, this is a no-nonsense city and we will not tolerate any misbehavior or um, illegal acts on the beach. So we try and get ahead of those situations before they get ahead of us. And I think that's it for us. I know I totally went over on time, but... <laughs> Anybody have any questions? That, that was great. Um, this is uh, Claudia. Thank you so much, um, David and Soraya. I mean, just getting that um, practical experience during a number of different events is just, you know, super, super helpful. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words about Everbridge and then we will open it up for questions. Um, just a, a little bit about Everbridge. Um, we, you know, we've been around for, uh, you know, well over 10 years. Um, we send about a billion messages a year. So we have an incredibly robust um, and efficient platform that can handle, you know, um, all kinds of events like the things that happened in, in Torrance that were talked about all the way to Hurricane Sandy where, you know, in the course of, uh, you know, a number of hours, millions and millions of messages have to go out. Um, so, you know, um, um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we have a suite of products, both Everbridge and Nixle, which enable you to, um, uh, to deliver um, notifications, but even beyond that, it's more about, you know, community engagement um, as an ongoing process, which I think, you know, was expressed so well today um, by, by Soraya and David. Um, the whole idea is being able to leverage, you know, all of the public safety organizations and the ongoing communications so that you always have a pipeline um, to your communities and all your residents, so then when something does occur, um, you know, like the uh, refinery fire, et cetera, an explosion, you're able to really reach people in a very broad and efficient manner across many different channels. So those channels include, you know, voice, email, SMS, social media channels, um, Google public alerts, you know, many different channels, iPods, et cetera, that Everbridge um, and Nixel together um, support. Um, so. So with that, um, we'll uh, turn it over um, for some questions, um, and I also want to thank everyone for joining today. Yeah, thanks again to you, Claudia, and thanks again, Soraya and David. Um, so we are going to uh, turn it over to Q&A. Uh, we do have quite a few questions. We're going to try and uh, move this along quickly, but what we will do is we'll share, um, just as a reminder, we will share the webinar um, on our website and these slides. Uh, the slides will be available on our blog, and the recording will be available um, in our resources section under webinars. Um, and you will get a follow-up email, anyone who's attended today with that information. So in case you forget, don't worry, you will get a reminder email uh, in the coming days. So let's, uh, let's kick this off, and uh, let's get through a couple questions. And again, any questions we don't get to, we'll try and follow up with you uh, after the webinar. And thanks again for everyone who's sticking on. Um, so the first uh, question, um, 
Let's see. John in Ohio. It's from Clint Hubbard, and he wants to know, Soraya, um, what was the uh, what was the fallout from the ash? Um, did, did it end up going downstream, or were you guys able, uh, or did it uh, just affect you guys? And how are you able to get those messages out? I, I'm going to actually I'm going to let Dave answer that question because he probably has a better um, technical piece of that. Uh, the ash uh, turned out to be a catalyst, which is part of that uh, electrostatic precipitator that helps taking the uh, electrostatic out of the the, uh, uh, the process. So that was thrown up into the air, and, and it was determined uh, by uh, both internal and external resources of being a non-toxic, non-hazardous uh, substance. The, like I said before, nobody knew it was up in the air until it started to come down. Once it started to come down, uh, we had units committed to the incident. We had to send. Um, separate units out to determine how widespread it was. Um, from the refinery to um, the ocean is probably about you know, four miles or so. They had evidence of some of the ash coming down um, in Redondo Beach. Um, what we didn't do, and Soraya touched on that a little bit, is, is reach out to our, our um, neighbors and, and let them know what was ha happening. And they found out via the media, but uh, we didn't do a, as great a job as getting that information out to them as well. So um, once we understood what it was, uh, we issued messages through the system that we, uh, through the Everbridge system, that it wasn't something that was uh, toxic nor hazardous. Obviously, the community was was concerned, uh, and there's that element of trust that you know who's putting out the message, and our subject matter experts, along with uh, local health hazmat. Uh, through other community members, assured people, other community uh, meetings, assured people that it was non-toxic and, and, and non-hazardous materials. That, thank you, David. So the next question um, is uh, for you, Soraya, um, and it's from Jim Barclay in the audience. He he, um, he stated, you know, he doesn't permit non-emergency messages to be transmitted, uh, such as farmers markets, because he's afraid citizens will stop stop answering or responding. Uh, the reason he mentions this, he wants to know what's your experience and uh, why you guys also send um, non-emergency messages, or what's your experience with sending non-emergency messages. Well, the community want the, what we've got gathered in our community is we a lot of people want to find out about what's happening, especially with like traffic traffic impacts where we're closing like <laughs> arteries of the city and things of that such. And we actually, um, our police department has a very active community affairs division that's out in the community all the time and they feel calls constantly of what's happening, why are, you know, what, what's going on. And so that was a, one way for us to stay in front of that messaging um, so that we're not getting inundated with a, an abundance of calls. The, the thing that we've, we've focused and we stress with our opt-in residents, we only call your residence, and we will only send a mass notification, truly an emergency mass notification, if it meets three criteria. If there's some type of life threat, property threat, or environment threat. The opt-in categories, every person that opts into the system can decide, I will only want to get traffic alerts. I don't care about farmer's market. I don't care about community services. I don't even care about if you have events in the city. All I want to find out is if there are traffic alerts. And so when we send non-emergency messages, we target them to if it's truly a traffic alert, we just select the rule traffic alert. We don't select any of the other groups. So it's very, very customizable to the person that's opting in so that you're not inundating them with an abundance of non-emergency messages so that it just becomes white noise. Thank you, Soraya. So the next question is again for you, Soraya. It's from um, Jim Barclay again. Uh, he wants to know, uh, when you were discussing one of your incidents, um, in order to implement the two-message protocol, do you have one message for inside your high impact area and then a separate one for the entire rest of the city? Um, do you have those messages pre-created or are you just drafting them on the fly? No, we pre-create them. Um, and you create, you don't have to be very, you can create the templates like I had said before with cues as to what type of information to include because obviously every message, the me every incident, the message is changing. I mean, it's going to change based on the incident. So you create the templates and you prompt the cues to provide the information, but again, they're separate messages um, that have to go out to that community. 
but you can also do them on the fly. But I mean, we we I mean, our recommendation is to pre-populate them because that it helps whoever's sending that message. Thank you, um, thank you, Sarah. The next one um, is from Josh, and he wants to know. Um, he, he uh, in quotations, mentioned you know no incident is a local incident. He wants to know uh, how you guys were able to or what type of messaging and coordination were you doing with outside uh, the city of Torrance's uh, depart uh, departments outside the city of Torrance to make sure that they were informed and also sharing information with you? Well, we established, we established Unified Command, um, and that was uh, our, uh, you know, the way we understand how to coordinate any type of agency response where there's more than one agency responding. So you have to implement Unified Command. Now we had several different agencies respond on scene, um, and we, like we had discussed, there were challenges with that public messaging getting out, and we've learned an abundance from that, ensuring that there truly is one voice um, in your unified command structure so that everything's being vetted through unified command so that that messaging is consistent. Um, you know, I think the, the big thing that we as emergency managers tote is our, all disasters are local. I mean, they all start local and then they move beyond. So understanding how you get your team and your people on board first is crucial and then how you then integrate with the agencies is the second step. And then uh, to that point as well, just this clarification, uh, as far as an emergency response goes, uh, the fire department uh, was able to manage and mitigate the incident with the current staff that we have. We didn't ask for nor did we have any requests out to mutual aid to any uh, fire or law resources. The resources that we use uh, for on normal uh, incidents of this type are LA County Health Hazmat, South Coast Air Quality, uh, those, those entities um, are a normal response to incidents such as these. Thank you, David. So we have another question from Andrew Stevens, and uh, Sarai, he wants to know how many different users uh, from different city departments have access to your Everbridge system, and he's not looking for an exact number, but what he means is what type of departments do you guys, you know, obviously the fire department, but what other departments are you guys coordinating with um, within your uh, city and uh, beyond? So um, in the Austin portal, we have different subscription type services. So our police and fire departments are pretty integrated and up and running. We also have public works. Um, so things messaging like street sweeping or, or non-street sweeping days, if those are canceled, water main breaks, um, uh, trash pickup, if the delays in trash pickup, those things, um, transit, transit delays, transit updates, non-routine transit issues, um, community, city services such as like events within the city, water conservation, that's a huge piece right now, um, is people wanting to hear about what we're doing as a city, different things that they can do and implement um, within our city, utility outages, again, fall, falling under public works, um, looking at um, we also have community services, so our libraries are huge hubs within our community. So getting information about out about library services, community services, like di different types of things. We also have community development involved um, with all their, you know, the issues with permits and building codes and remodels and hillsides and there's so many different pieces to that. Um, you know, notifying homeowner groups and those types of things. So we really have expanded it to um, not just public safety centric, it's really an opportunity for everyone in our city and that was truly the intent is we aren't just going to use this for public safety, we're really going to integrate this and use it as a, a fully functioning city resource so that we can connect with our community on different forums so that the community, community can be more engaged in our city processes. Okay. So, uh, we, we have gone about 15 minutes over our time slot and we do appreciate everyone uh, staying on and we um, I thank you again Sarai and David and Claudia for staying on a little extra long we appreciate it um, as mentioned any questions that we didn't get to and I know there were a few uh, we will f um, have someone follow up with you um, in addition to that uh, if any of you are interested in requesting a demo of the Everbridge system or have further questions uh, feel free to visit everbridge.com uh, backslash request dash demo um, again Thank you all and uh, for joining us today in our audience, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Have a great day.